I am an electrical engineer. And we engineers often look at nature as a source of inspiration to design new technologies. For example, here is the kingfisher bird. Its beak enables it to dive into water without making any splash. So then, that inspired the shape of bullet trains in Japan. So now they can go through tunnels without making the loud boom they used to make before. Now, I can speak and mention a lot of different examples of nature-inspired technologies that we all have in our daily lives. But I don't want to talk about this today. I also don't want to talk about these big solutions. I would like to talk about solutions at the nanoscale by using materials that behave like nature to solve some of the, of the major challenges that we're facing today. And talking about challenges, we are all addicted. We're completely dependent on chips. You know, I'm not talking about potato chips, I'm talking about electronic chips. We carry them in our pockets, they control nearly every single aspect of our lives. When you look inside these chips, we see a tiny component, the transistor, whose main function is to switch on and off electric currents, just like what we have in our light switches at home, except that it's so small that you can fit more than a billion of them inside a single chip. Pretty simple function, isn't it? Just to turn on and off currents. And yet, we manage to make extremely complicated functions out of this chip, even artificial intelligence. But the evolution of these chips have, has relied on the reduction of the size of the transistors themselves. Down to a point that today they're so small, only five nanometers. There are only a few tens of atoms inside them. So you cannot keep redu reducing their size any further. So what if we could replace these transistors by materials that could offer more functions, maybe even some nature-like functions? Today, I would like to take you on a laboratory tour, and I would like to show you two new technologies that could be used in future chips. So for the first one, we were interested in measuring the time response of different materials. And the experiment is very simple. We send a voltage pulse, that's the excitation, and we measure how fast the material responds to that pulse by conducting current. An analogy would be if I take my arm, the excitation could be me pinching the arm, and I would measure how long the sensory cells would transmit that signal to my brain. If we apply this technique to typical electronic materials, the time between the excitation and the response is immediate. The material conducts current at the time that it has been excited. Now, there's a class of materials, the phase change materials, that includes vanadium oxide, for which the time between the excitation and the response can be extremely long. Now, this is something that scientists have known for a while, but what was interesting is that if we repeated the same experiment, we actually saw that the response of the material was completely random. How come we repeated the exact same experiment, and yet the response was completely random? It didn't make any sense. Oh, yeah, that's at least what we thought. Actually, in reality, it wasn't the material's response that was random. It was our experiment. If we made a well-controlled experiment where we sent two pulses separated by a precise time, let's say 10 milliseconds, then what we notice is that the response for the second pulse was always shorter than that for the first pulse. And this was a very predictable thing. If we change the time between pulses from 10 milliseconds all the way to 100 seconds, the response of the material is very deterministic. It seemed that the material could remember when it had been excited before, 
and change its response accordingly. Some sort of memory. In our first analogy, it would be the same as me pinching my arm again, and the response of my sensory cells would change according to how long ago I had been pinched before, as if my arm had some sort of memory. Now, would you be surprised if this memory could last even for hours? Yes, that's what we observed. It's amazing. It means that the material could remember that it had been excited even hours before, and it changed its response accordingly. And this is clearly not a temperature-induced effect, and it wasn't an electric charge-based effect like conventional memories that we have. Here, the memory was actually stored in the structure of the material. So we now can start thinking of this as synapses in our brains. Once one synapse is made, it actually becomes easier to make it again. The material starts learning. But if you don't activate that synapse again, it slowly forgets that information. So we could imagine in future neuromorphic uh, computation where artificial neurons could be connected by this kind of materials. Let's say that we train this network to perform a certain function, and a set of synapses is made. It now become, becomes much easier to reactivate a set of synapses again, so the material is learning. And this can all be done where the weight coefficients between these connections is actually stored in hardware, not software. So this could potentially change the way learning is done, which could be done in a much more natural way like our brain does. So this brings me to the second technology that I would like to talk to you about today. If we look at the amount of data that our society uses, it means that every new generation of chips needs to be much more powerful than the previous one. And more power means more heat. And you know that. You turn on your laptop today, you can feel how much heat it produces. And the problem is way worse when you go to data centers, where thousands of servers are running in parallel. Heat's such a big issue that today CPUs actually run below their capability. They are downclocked to prevent overheating. So let's try to understand how heat is extracted from chips. So usually we connect a big piece of metal, the heat sink, on top of the chip. The function of this heat sink is to conduct the heat from the chip upwards where a big fan blows air and throws that hot air into the room. So, of course, by cooling the chip, it also means that we need to spend electricity now in air conditioning to cool down the rest of the room. So the heat is basically generated a few microns close to the surface of the chip, and now it needs to propagate several centimeters before being extracted. Let me put in perspective this. Let's imagine that we are all here electrons. We're close to the hot spot of a chip. We're all producing heat. If we were to use this technology, it would be the same of having someone in Italy blowing air to cool us down here in Arendelle. Doesn't make any sense, does it? And yet, that's how cooling of electronics is done today. So in my laboratory, we've been thinking of ways to bring the heat sink much closer to the hot spot. And our approach has been to make tiny microtubes inside the chip itself, very close to where the device heats up the most. So now we can flow liquids inside the device and extract the heat. So if you take a chip, you flip it over, you now see a network of tubes of different sizes. We can now flow liquids inside, and liquid could be simply water. It absorbs the heat, and it leaves. So now we can use this hot liquid somewhere else. For example, we can heat up the building. And the environment close to the, to the chip is rather cool, so you don't need to spend any extra electricity in air conditioning to cool down the room. Now, liquid cooling is not really the novelty here. Scientists have known this for quite a while. What is novel is that now we can design the electronics and cooling at the same stage. 
this can be done very close to each other. And this led to a 30 times higher cooling capability and 100 times higher energy efficiency compared to heat sinks and fans that we have today. Now, I know you must be thinking, oh, that's really cool, but it must be very expensive. And no, it's not. It actually can be much cheaper. And the reason is that we can now make hundreds or even thousands of these structures in parallel using the same process. The process that actually is well established to make electronics now can be used for cooling. And more importantly, chips don't really heat up the same way at the surface. There are regions that actually heat up more than others. So now we can change the size of these microtubes according to the amount of power that's being dissipated in different regions. And this is very similar to what our body has done to our vascular system, where the size of veins and capillaries change according to the amount of heat and oxygen it needs to exchange, and also to reduce the amount of pressure that's required from the heart. And we can do even better. We can ask computers to help us solve their own problems and help us optimize this complex network of tubes. So if we feed the power map of a given chip to a topology-based solver, the computer program can find the optimal geometry and distribution of the microfluidic tubes that needs to be done to optimally cool down that chip. So that means that future chips will now have their optimized heat sink already embedded inside them. So we published these results in a very prestigious journal. And after this, a lot of chip makers came to us interested in this technology to their own chips. So we started a, a startup called Corintis to actually develop this technology to the cooling of data center chips. And this can have a massive impact. So the cooling of data centers in the US alone requires electricity and water that's equivalent to the needs of a city of the size of Philadelphia, just for cooling. So by making this step more efficient, we can reduce the amount of electricity and carbon footprint related to the cooling of data centers. Now, it's quite interesting that after a few minutes, the computer program found something that looks very similar to what nature has found to our bodies. Or since we're here in Norway, does this remind you of something else? Something else that nature has done to the Norwegian coastline. Now, as I know, fjords have not been designed to evacuate heat. But hopefully, by reducing the carbon footprint related to cooling of data centers, hopefully fjords were also not going to be there to evacuate more melting. Thank you very much. <laughs>